finally we get a comedy episode. After the last couple of serious episodes with very few funny moments, it's really nice. It's also the first one we get where a centered guest character is someone who actually existed in real life. In this case, it's famous writer Mark Twain, who began his life and this episode as Samuel Clemens. Howard Duff plays Sam Clemens this time, and as an aside that I'll talk about again when we get to the next episode many seasons from now where Mark Twain appears, called The 26th Grave, Mark is played by someone else who seems to be a similar age as he is here, which doesn't make much sense. Anyway, for now I'll just say that I love Howard's portrayal. He's very good at playing the side, the humor side of Bonanza, as of course are the car rides. We see an opening shot of Virginia City that we will see used many times in the first few seasons. A dirty drifter, who looks like he just came from several weeks of high ho in at the mine, asks for directions to the newspaper office from a marshal? So, Ginny, Ginny City had a marshal at one point, apparently. Huh. What do you know? Either way, he doesn't seem to be doing much. He's clearly one of those good old lawmen who minds his own business. So he's not really prompted to respond when Joe comes flying out of the saloon. Several times. Hang on a second. Uh, sorry, hold on. How old is Joe supposed to be here? 17? 18? Don't be letting that boy in the saloon. What are you thinking? Jeez. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Haas is getting tired of it and finally pulls him away and we never really get to see what the thorn under Joe's saddle was. Sam helping Joe up and wanting to assist him in whatever the conflict was, though, is really endearing to watch. I love it. The next folks that the young newspaper man meets are Judge Jeremy C. Billington and his uptight wife, Lucy. Clemens is asked to hold the horse and then strikes up a brief conversation with the royal lady. When the judge returns, he chides her about talking to strangers, and she says that he was talking to her. She wasn't talking to him. Clearly the more clever of the couple, so you get a sense that she's the brains behind the political campaign. Next, Sam goes to the newspaper office, where he is called an old-timer and assumed to be a drunk miner. He explains that he was never any good at mining, and he's actually the one that the newspaper man has been in contact with about taking a job. He explains to, the newspaper man explains to Sam that Virginia City is 2,000 miles east of the Mississippi, rather than the Mississippi being 2,000 miles east of Virginia City. They're clearly hyping up the little town on a mountain, going so far as to mention that it is a city and not a town, as a high point of pride in her favor. Meanwhile, Haas and Joe find a little squatter man on their land. Percy Hilton plays the old man and a few others throughout the series, and he's actually always funny, and I'm sure was probably typecast, because he's just got a certain look about him. I personally always enjoy his characters. He's a quirky little curmudgeon. In this episode, Haas and Joe kick him off the land, and he's sure to pour sand all over his campfire on his way out, muttering about how he knows how to put out a, a campfire. In the distance, the old squatter looks up and sees someone running around in such a way that you can't help but be reminded of your run-of-the-mill Bigfoot sighting. He assumes it's an Injun spirit and takes off while the getting's good. He appears to have chosen the saloon to seek refuge from the monster because that's where our friendly neighborhood funnies column newspaper man finds him. This is, a gr this is a gift that falls into Sam's lap because he wants to write about the everyday citizens of town anyway, and this is even better. He helps the lead along by filling him up with whiskey, as is standard practice for interviewing a source. That's great reporting there, Sam. And the good old source allows Sam to embellish details until the wild man stands ten feet tall and has a wagon tongue in its mouth. Back on the Ponderosa, Haas covers for Joe with Ben about the fight from the opening scene, and you just gotta love Big Brother Haas. The boys ride through some of that gorgeous country land of theirs, and they find a group of surveyors doing some shady things, using the old refrain that they don't know the Ponderosa boundary line. I feel like we've done this several times already, even though this is just the fourth episode, but I can forgive it this time, I guess. They look at one of the pieces of equipment left behind, and Adam throws it on the ground and leaves it there. They actually litter on their own land. I'm thinking that doesn't make sense. Over now to the Virginia City Gossip Grave Bombing. It's a new episode of Secrets of Ponderosa Ranch, as Sam writes all about the wild man. Honestly, I'm sure he probably has no real idea how seriously everyone was going to take this whole thing. 
then again, maybe he did know that human nature tends to be like that. I don't know. I feel like if he had stayed around long enough, though, he might have run into one of those people who was abducted by aliens and brought back to tell the tale. If only he'd stuck it out just a little longer. We'll never know how many folks would have come forward with their stories. Unfortunate. Those little green men are out there, folks. Ask Hoss. In walks Adam to do something that I'm sure every celebrity wants to do at some point in their careers. He demands a retraction, and when Sam denies it to him, he pops him one square in the jaw. Sam takes it like a pro, though, and just has one more reason to like those car rides. Sam's boss promises that the, rea the retraction is coming. He doesn't make any promises for how Mr. Clemens is going to write it, though. On the way home, Adam runs into the wild man and chases after it. He nabs it and takes his prize back to the ranch. While they're enjoying their dinner later that night, Ben has just finished warning them to stay together when going out, just in case a land grab is in the works, when a frantic hop sing comes bursting in to inform them that Adam is like me when I see newborn kittens and doesn't know his boys from his girls. Joe, of course, is a teenage boy and a youngest child about the whole thing and offers to help Adam out next time. Just a side note, it might be the camera angle, but the kitchen table looks a little too small for them here. Maybe it's just me. Let me know what you think. Anyway, Hop Singh burned the clothes the girl was wearing, so she's stuck where she is. Adam gets up to take care of it, pushing Joe back down in the process. The way he stops in front of the door and nervously rubs his hand against his chest reminds me of later in The Savage, when he's again shy around another girl who he assumes suffers from a lack of clothing, but we'll talk about that later. He takes a blanket and rushes out of there, being followed by his family's laughter. Joe's being the loudest. Joe's trademark cackle seems to be absent here. Adam throws the blanket into the room and tells the person inside to put it on and come out. While they wait for her to come out, Adam says they'll just have to get rid of her, which shows again how underdeveloped the seas were at this early point in the game, because the boys we come to know aren't so quick to act like that. The young lady, Rosemary Lawson, nervously enters the house, being led by a kind hop sing, and is still draped in the blanket. It has to be incredibly difficult for this girl in that moment coming out into a home with all men you've never met before after suffering as we soon find out she suffered at the hands of men. Again, reminiscent of another woman Adam meets at another time. Anne Whitfield does a great job of conveying these emotions and the way Hop Singh is standing behind her grinning is just so sweet. I love that man. These five men want nothing but to be kind. Rosemary is in safe hands at last. And I also have to say that the music to accompany this scene is so good. It adds to the feeling of anxiety the audience is supposed to feel for the girl. As she's talking, we see Joe's hands in his pockets. It's a small detail, but I don't feel like that happens too much. The hands in the pockets seems more like a Charles Ingalls thing to do than a Joe Cartwright thing. Adam bends down in front of her and asks why she ran from him. She says she thinks they're friends and therefore safe to talk to, and goes on to explain that her father was a school teacher. They left San Francisco to come to Virginia City. Her father was drawn into the silver rush, and it led him to come west. One night, while camped in the mountains, some strange men came and they killed her father. She'd been asleep after a lovely evening by a fire with her father singing to her. After she finishes her story, Ben sends Hop Sing with her to her room at the end of the bunkhouse and asks him to feed her. When she's gone, Hoss compares her to a Philly colt they found last spring, whose mom was killed by a hunter. The only means of conveying what happened to Rosemary after her father died is right before the scene ends. Adam says they did more to her than kill her father. Of course, shows back then had limits on how to handle certain kinds of violence, such as what we are led to understand happened here. It's painfully obvious, though. They do a good job of making your gut knot up with just their facial expressions. We never find out how she managed to get out alive, but we know that she very well could have died. Whether that can be called lucky with what was done to her depends on an individual view of what is worse than dying. This girl clearly, clearly had a will to live, though, and became a survivor with good friends like the Cartwrights. This is a heavy scene in a comedy episode. More on my thoughts about how it fits, or doesn't, at the end of this review. The Cartwrights take an extended ride through that amazing Ponderosa of theirs again, with peaceful music to go along with it, this time finding another man making camp. Ben's, all right, who are you and what are you doing here? 
It's just pure joy. He's so tired of it, of it all and has just the right amount of sarcasm. Lauren does a great job conveying that, too. A much gentler way of saying, get the heck off our land, than what we're used to so far. This one is Dr. Lovejoy, a representative of a scientific group who is here to fish for the body in the lake. The Yeti has died, and they want to check out the corpse. Fun times. Somehow it is encased in a block of ice, as well as sinking to the bottom of Tahoe. They kick out the good doctor, who has enough sense to put out the fire correctly, in contrast to the prospector. He's played by a man with the same last name as the character, and his face looks rather familiar, yet I can't place it, and that's going to bother me. Back in town, the old windbag himself, Jeremy C. Billington, is making another stirring speech in the saloon, with his wife having a whiskey with a man at one of the tables. He knows how to get cowboys to pay attention. He buys them all a drink. In walks our dear reporter, and he strikes up another conversation with the wannabe future first lady of Virginia City. She sees him and s sends her companion packing without a word. I wonder how much these extras are paid when they don't even get to speak. Mrs. B is wearing a red dress with a hat that looks like it has an eye in the form of a brooch on top of it. As they talk, she discourages Sam's dreams by telling him that he won't get anywhere in writing. That's one way to make a friend. Tell him that all of his dreams are useless and he'll never make it as a podcaster for an old west... I mean, a newspaper man who makes jokes. He starts to tell her the story of a frog jumping contest that some might have already been familiar with when she cuts him off. I love how he defends his work and doesn't let her offend him. She suggests he should go into politics. He talks about wanting to travel to Paris and Rome and she shoots that down too. A woman with a taste for money who wouldn't want to see Paris and Rome. Just when I thought her character was all figured out. Or at least that I had her all figured out. He tells her that she might be able to buy votes with whiskey, but not what he prints. He pays for his own drinks and leaves. She has a look on her face that she looks like she's impressed with him. Josh goes back to work and thus professional professor personal pronoun is born. Blah, blah, blah. That's hard to say. I'm keeping that blooper in. That's just too funny. I've had, I've, had, I've had to record that so many times. I'm just keeping that in. You're welcome. He's sick of the typical chuckle factory writing he's been doing and decides to make it count. He starts by questioning why Billington spends so much money running for judge, if he always wins anyway. The boys find those same men snooping around the ranch again, and they chase them into Virginia City, guns blazing. They wound one who falls off his horse. They cart his carcass back to town just in time for the judge and Miss Minnie to see them take him into the office of a man named Lash. The judge is already in Lash's office when Ben throws the henchman across his desk. As the cartwrights leave, Sam remarks that railroad stocks just took a little drop. Later that day, the seas are poring over their maps trying to figure out what these men are after. Ben surmises that 25,000 acres of prime timber and grazing land is reason enough to bypass the main railroad line. Furthermore, the only way a court would side with it is if the court is someone who is already on their side. Hence all the money going into Billington's campaign. Rosemary comes in all dressed up and they remark one more time to tease Adam about thinking she was a boy. They imply that Hop Singh took her shopping, which is so dadgum sweet, it's liking to kill me. Sam comes riding in, and they introduce him to the wild man, complete in her pink dress. He's riding a mule, which is so typical of this guy by now. Rosemary's spirits are so much lighter now, and she seems genuinely happy. See what a few days on the Ponderosa will do for you? I think after I finish this interview, I'm going to go book my stay. Who's coming with me? Anybody? Clemens informs them that there are warrants out for their arrest. Ben sends Rosemary to inform Hop Singh that they have a guest, and they all talk inside. That little hint of protectiveness is subtle, but it's totally there. Also, Ben is wearing a sky blue shirt in this scene, and it looks really good on him. They're still a long way from being in their trademark costumes. He goes on to tell Clemens how hard he's worked to acquire the Ponderosa, and that he's not letting Lash or anybody else take it. Ben says they will fight even if it means fighting the law. I don't think you have the proper respect for guns, Mr. Clemens, says Joe, when Sam suggests that they can't fight the law with guns. 
Sam takes Joe's gun, twirls it, tells him it has good balance, hands it back to him, and goes on talking. We get that classic, the pen is mightier than the sword line. Ben says he can do it his way, but that they will be around with their guns if he needs their help. That sounds more like, to me, like they're helping rather than it being their problem, but I do get what he's saying. The first article on the PPP, uh, no, not that one, comes out and the boys get a kick out of it. The judge and his entourage, not so much. Clemens gets beat up in a back alley, and in true Bonanza fashion, this just makes him want to stop them more. Meanwhile, one of the cronies brings up a bag of gold to the Billington's hotel suite. Sam is in the corner doing the cliché, reading a newspaper over his face, and follows just in time to see Miss Minnie lose her dress over a sack of coins. She sure talks smart for someone who figures her nighty is sturdy enough to hold all that dope. Of course, this ends up in the next issue of the paper. We cut to Lash deciding to have Sam killed, but we never see how the grand lady took this written tribute to her. Shame, that. During another one of the old judge's speeches, Sam is taken by gunpoint outside. He gets away and causes enough ruckus to stop everyone from listening to the speech. Miss Minnie has to tell her dear husband when to quit because he'd rather keep hearing himself drone on. The Cartwrights aid Sam back into his office, where he hurriedly writes his expose as they shoot at Lash's men. During the fray, Sam gets kind of a glassy-eyed reminiscing look when he's talking about his days on the banks of the Mississippi. He decides that calling himself Josh isn't going to cut it anymore. Finally, he lands on Mark Twain. Real clear sailing. Haas doesn't like it much, and doesn't think it's a fitting name for a writer. With the story finished, both Rosemary and the newly dubbed Mark Twain leave Virginia City. He on the stage, and her in a puff of Bonanza cannon smoke, because we never see or hear from her again. I don't know if maybe they intended to keep her around, but they sure don't explain it. It's not the last time this happens with a side character, either. There's a lot to love about this episode, especially if you love Bonanza comedy and also are a history buff who enjoys those episodes dealing with historical figures. My one complaint is with the B story. Their decision to put a serious story like Rosemary's in there with a story about Mark Twain that was played for comedy doesn't seem to fit, especially when you consider that we never hear what happens to her. I know they need to explain the wild man, but they could have done that without it being such a dark subject matter. They handle it very well, but it just feels awkward in that particular episode. I like how friendly the Cartwrights are with Sam after they realize he's on their side, and of course I love how they handle all of the professor, professor personal pronoun. It's one of those that I rewatch often, not just in researching for the podcast. As always, let me know what your thoughts are.